Hi everyone, thank you for inviting me to present at the fourth annual National Research Conference. I'm Jamie Miles and I'm here to present my study using vignettes to assess the accuracy and rationale of paramedic decisions on conveyance to the emergency department, which was published in the BPJ last year. I'd like to start by thanking my supervisors and co-authors, Joe Costa and Richard Jakes, for their patience and support. This study also couldn't have happened without the University of Sheffield, Yorkshire Ambulance Service, the Clark, now ARC, Yorkshire and Humber, and the Centre for Urgent and Emergency Care Research here in Sheffield. Now, with all good funders, there's a good disclaimer, so please read this at your leisure. And without further ado, let's begin. Now, in the beginning, the ambulance service focused on transporting patients to hospital as quickly as possible. But this started to change over the last 10 years. There have been numerous policy documents that have highlighted how our case mix has shifted from the accidents and emergencies of critically ill patients to the diverse physical, mental and social needs that our patients present with today. Our patients sometimes don't need taking to the ED. They could be left at home. But are we equipped to be making these often complex decisions? This is what we aim to find out. We wanted to know how accurate these decisions were and how paramedics were justifying them. So here's how we climbed such a mountain. We used a validating quantitative data design. This means we collect both quantitative and qualitative data at the same time, but we analyze them separately. We then use the qualitative data to support the final synthesis of information derived from the quantitative. This study was set within Yorkshire Ambulance Service, which has 62 ambulance stations scattered amongst urban, rural and coastal settings. It attends around 800,000 incidents a year and has around 1,250 paramedics. I'm going to talk through the methods and how we created the vignettes. We started by using an existing data set created by ARC, Yorkshire and Humber. It had 404,348 linked records of patients in Yorkshire from the ambulance call through to their journey in ED and also their inpatient stay if they were admitted. Now for each patient that was in the data set, we created a binary variable to decide if their ED experience was necessary or not. This was done using a process-based definition and further detail can be found in the full paper, so check it out. When we did this, we found that 92% of all the patients we transported had a clinical need for the ED, but there was 8% who perhaps did not. We then further subset the data into the six most common codes on AMPDS. This was to encourage a robust sample size for each vignette, but also to prevent any obscure cases finding their way into the study. Once we had picked out the six most common, we randomly assigned an outcome to half of the codes. This meant we had six pots of data. Each pot only had one AMPDS code and one outcome. So for example, one pot was breathing problems that were avoidable. Another was psychiatric problems that needed the ED. Now we have subset the data, we can start to create the vignettes. We started by randomly drawing a patient from the first pot. We then went back to the ambulance data to screen for eligibility. We needed to ensure that the patient wasn't too exciting in case they could be identified. It also wouldn't be fair to examine decision making on complex cases. We also needed to ensure there was enough information recorded on the patient care record to create a vignette and for a paramedic to make a decision. If it fails screening, another random patient was drawn out and the screening process was repeated. Once the patient met all the eligibility, the patient care record was anonymized and transposed. The vignette ended on scene and the paramedics were blinded to that true outcome. Once all six vignettes had been created, they were given to an expert panel with all the information, including the outcome. They judged whether they agreed with the classification of avoidable or not, and any disagreements were resolved on a two-to-one vote. The panel consisted of a professor of emergency medicine, an academic GP, and an associate director of paramedic practice. And luckily, they all agreed. So let's meet the patients. A quick disclaimer, these are completely fictitious representations of the patients. However, the description is directly quoted from the CAD information. So first, we have a 23-year-old female with a suspected asthma attack. Next is a 64-year-old male with severe left kidney pain. Then we have a 21-year-old female unconscious breathing. An 85-year-old male where triage is not possible. A 19-year-old female who can't move and can't feel hands. 
And finally, a 37-year-old female who cut herself. We then put all these vignettes into an online survey. We asked two questions for each vignette. The first was asking for the most appropriate destination. This was presented as a five-level hierarchical choice. However, in the results, it was dichotomized to ED or not. The second question asked them to justify the response to the first. This was then disseminated to all paramedics in Yorkshire. And after we'd closed the survey, there was a grand total of 243 responses. So let's take a look at the results. Now, before I dive right in, I want to spend a moment to run through sensitivity and specificity. If you take a random sample of 10 people, half of them have the disease, the other half do not. Let's change their clothes to make it easy to spot. Green are positive, red are negative. Now, if we present these to a perfect diagnostic test or decision maker, it will be able to spot all the positives and all the negatives with no mistakes. So this leaves us with 100% sensitivity and 100% specificity. However, suppose it does make a mistake. Suppose it accidentally classifies someone as having the disease when in fact they don't. Well, this is called a false positive and it should really be in the negative class. The more false positives there are, the specificity starts to drop. Similarly, if it classifies someone as healthy when actually they have the disease, this is known as a false negative. And in medicine, this is the dangerous one everybody wants to avoid. The more false negatives that appear, the sensitivity goes down. But these are trade-offs. In order for us to make sure all the true positives are in the right place, we open the door for more false positives to be misjudged. This is because we change the threshold to a much lower level to increase safety. Keeping with this analogy, the paramedics are being asked to judge each patient and give them a red or green jumper. So let's see how they did. The sensitivity in the sample of 243 paramedics was 90%, but the specificity was 49%. We used a sample of paramedics. If we repeated the study 100 times with different samples, these results might change slightly. We can calculate a range that we would expect the results to fall within in at least 95 of these repeated studies. This is the confidence interval and can be seen here. Now, let's take a moment to relax and in, explore the reasons behind some of these decisions. If we start with the true positives, the paramedics were making empathetic decisions through the eyes of the patients, but they mitigated risk and frequently mentioned the safety of the patient. If we move on to the false positives, the paramedics often described investigations and treatments the patients might have at hospital, such as a CT scan or bloods. But there wasn't a clear explanation for which bloods or why there was a need to scan. This could hint at limited knowledge of the ED beyond that handover exchange. Next up are the true negatives, and the paramedics would often refer to the normality of the patient. They made comments that took into account the episode in the context of the whole patient and not focusing on this presentation in isolation. And finally, we have the false negatives. And the paramedics appeared to be trying to rule in an alternative care as opposed to ruling out the ED. And quite often paramedics in this group referred to the GP being the decision maker and hence an inability to challenge traditional medical hierarchy. Now I hope you've enjoyed this presentation, but before I go, I just want to spend a minute discussing the limitations or research bloopers. First of all, this was a theoretical study. But a way to improve its validity is to ditch the computer and design a pragmatic study that observes decisions in action. Secondly, there could be a selection bias as the survey was only disseminated electronically, which could limit participation for those who aren't confident with computers. Thirdly, there was a screening bias. The study had a disproportionate amount of young females. Even though there was randomization, the sample of patients was so low that this can happen. It would be better in future to add in checks and balances to prevent this from happening. Anyway, I really hope you enjoyed this presentation. The only thing left for me to do is to get changed, sit down and answer any questions.